And Peter, off you go. Okay, great. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Peter Bohatchek, and I'm a high school physics teacher at Henry Sibley High School. It's a little south of uh, where Andy is in Mendota Heights, kind of a suburb of St. Paul. So I'm going to work on trying to share my screen here. Give me a quick second. Okay, is that working? Can you guys, so the idea should be that I have a, a quick time presentation uh, that you should see a guy on a cart going across the stage with a black background. Hey, Peter. Yes. Um, so you said quick time, but you meant keynote. But also yes, let, me, let me just have, encourage everyone to, if you could, just move that window to the side a little bit. And if everyone could just take a moment to, to type in who they are. I forgot to do this, Peter. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, great. That's who great. you are, you. what school you teach at, where in the country you are. And then um, while you're doing that, let me also just say that what, what Peter would like us to do is just kind of reorient that window, zoom in, use your um, resizing abilities to just see the sort of the meat of his keynote presentation. There's no reason to see the rest of his, his desktop, but we needed to do that for a couple of other multimedia reasons. So I'm going to check back out, Peter, and you know, just let people give people a second to type in their names here and then get back going. Sorry about that. Great, thanks. All right, Peter, that's, we can get going, I think. Let's see. Oh, I think I lost it. Right, now I'm back on. OK, great. Uh, so first of all, Andy, I really appreciate you, you uh, setting up this global physics department. Ever since I heard the idea, I thought it was wonderful. And so I'm really pleased to be able to, uh, to be here and present this tonight. Uh, so the idea that I want to talk about is, is using video to teach physics. I, I teach um, a college prep physics class and an AP physics class. I've been teaching for about 10 years. It's my second career. I was in, uh, in the industry for 15 years before this. And early on in teaching, I saw that using video, uh, like a lot of people I, I, that I learned from, using video to teach physics is a great idea. So I certainly don't want to give the impression that that's a new thing. Uh, most of the methods for using video to teach that I had seen involved using some sort of video analysis program like Logger Pro, where you'd get a video and click frame by frame on the video and get uh, uh, position versus time, velocity versus time, and so on, graphs of that. Students use those graphs to find relationships and data that they can use to analyze the motion. And I, I think that works very well. There's lots of advantages that I think have been well, well documented. You can use interesting videos that the students like. A couple of the disadvantages that I've noticed is that putting the dots on those can be pretty time consuming. And if you if you want students to analyze lots and lots of videos, my students have complained, not out of laziness, but just out of sort of repetitive, I've got to click more dots on this graph. They also all have to have the software loaded on their machine. And it's pretty time consuming to grade, to go through. And I have a, a lot of students. And so any time that I can do something to make my grading easier, I'm always looking for that. So the approach that I've been working on for the past few years is to take videos that are filmed in such a way that 
Hey everybody, I can see that uh, Peter has a, a red block on his uh, microphone and I think that that just means that he'll either start sounding like a chipmunk to us pretty soon or it'll kick him out. Yep, it just kicked him out. So um, he's, he's already back in. Um, I see him down there, so let me just give him the moderator privileges. Huh. So you're back in, Peter. Can you share your screen again? Yes, that's strange. I wonder what happened. Is that working? Yep, it's working fine. Okay. And actually, I have to unshare the screen because I've got to get that micromedia window back up. There it is. All right. We're back. Okay, now is that visible? Were people able to see that video? So what's happening here, folks, is that QuickTime is loading on your own machine and um, you should be seeing a video. And so maybe a little checkbox if that's working for you, just so we know who can see it and who, who's having troubles. Oh, excellent. Okay, so it looks like there are people that are not seeing it. So what, what I can do is uh, bring the same video up. So we'll actually be able to see it in, in two ways. Now the video is up just over my keynote presentation. So if you don't have it in, in QuickTime, you can at least see. You're not going to be able to see the video play, but you can at least see the video that we're, that we're talking about. So I guess maybe a, a new question is, can everybody see it in one, one place or another? Now the people who have it up in QuickTime, uh, from, what, from what Andy described, I think that you can actually play the video on your own all the way through, but the people who are looking at it on my screen will only be able to see it as, as I play it. Okay, so I'm going to continue. Uh, so if you start at the beginning of the video, so the question that I pose to the students for this, for this video is, what's the amount of force or thrust that that rocket motor is producing while this thing spins? And so they, they need to know uh, something about the angular motion. They need to know the angular acceleration. And the way they can find that is by, if they go through this video frame by frame, they can see that the rocket motor starts somewhere around frame seven. And uh, then they can advance one frame at a time. And so here I've got mine advanced so that at frame 44, it's made one complete, complete revolution. So, so far, they now know an initial angular velocity was, was zero. They know an angular displacement. It's gone two pi radians. They know a, a time because it's gone 44 frames at 30 frames per second. So they can find an angular acceleration from that. Then they also need to know the, to find the rotational inertia of the disk, they need that distance measurement, the diameter measurement that they could get off that scale right in the beginning, and they need to know the mass. So the ma mass isn't on this uh, video, and I'll explain a little bit more. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about why the mass is not there. Yes, Andy, I just anticipated your rule, and I looked at the uh, at the chat board. So let's see if I can answer that question. The question was, how did, it, how did I put the overlay on the video? Uh, I draw all the overlays in Adobe Illustrator, and then it turns out that they work best to then export them into Photoshop and from Photoshop into, uh, into Final Cut Pro, which is the video editing software that I use. So the first couple of times I did that, it took a long time. Uh, but as, I get, as you get the hang of it, it doesn't take that long. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so, okay, so that's the basic idea. That's the first example that just sort of, sort of gives you the idea. What, what I'd like to do is sort of show you some of the variety of videos that I've uh, made and some of the different ways in which we uh, use them. So I'm going to close this one and bring up the next one and bring it up in two places, kind of same way we did. It's brought up. If you have quick time, you should be seeing this with a, a white and red grid across it and a tile floor underneath. And then here's the version. for the people who don't have that. Okay, so is that working now? I think uh, maybe we could say if it's not working, people could put a red X. And it looks to me like I just lost the QuickTime video. The uh, Hey, Peter, I think I know what's happening here. Because I am also a moderator, I closed mine just so I could see your other thing. I think that when I close it, because I'm a moderator, it closes it for everyone. So that's my mistake. Oh, no problem. Okay, so that now it's back up. Yep, exactly. Great. Okay, thanks. Okay, so this video, uh, I'm sure people are familiar with these hover pucks, this uh, little battery-powered thing that pushes air out the bottom and it slides with low friction across the lab floor. In this case, the camera is attached to the ceiling of the lab, and we've got a grid overlaid. And so the idea is that we can look at two-dimensional, non-accelerated motion. So in the video here, it starts at the origin in the bottom left. And as we advance, we can see, we can look at just the horizontal motion. So for example, here it's gone in 29 frames, so about a second, it's gone one meter to the east. So they can get a, a horizontal velocity of this thing just, uh, just to the east. And we continue and wait until it's gone one meter to the north or in the, in the y direction. So it looks like about 60 three frames it takes for it to go, so call it roughly half a meter per second. And so now they, can, they have these two components, and they can learn vector addition, try their vector addition, and see what they get. They should be able to get an angle, and they can verify that that angle is right by looking at the direction that the puck actually goes across this, this protractor. So that lets them know that their angle is right. They can also check that their velocity is right, because the red grid lines are, uh, allow them to look at one meter or half meter intervals in the direction that the puck is actually going. So going all the way back to the origin, we can look at those red half meter interval circles. So it'll probably take your screen a minute to catch up, but there I am. It's now traveled one meter across the floor in 27 frames. So it lets them see the x and y, or, or uh, east and north components of velocity, try vector addition and see that that matches what they uh, what the actual motion of the puck was across the floor. So I, I again I looked at the uh, uh, the chat board, the idea that they look Dan Myers, and you're exactly right. Dan Myers uh, he has a lot of the same uh, ideas, where his videos are also ones where you can get information off of the off of the grid. So I agree that there's a lot of similarity. Not all of the situations that he and I have videotaped are the same, but I think the approach is very similar. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next one. So one of the things that we've been able to do with this is I put a lot of focus for the last couple of years on measurement uncertainty. And some of these really work nicely because the, the measurement certainty becomes very obvious. When the students are making measurements, they can only see the, the measurements to a certain level of certainty. So for these next two videos, I didn't download these to the multimedia library. I'm just going to show you these on the, on the main screen. Uh, and I think that that will, that, that ought to work just fine. So the first one here, these were both taken at Valley Fair, an amusement park that's near here. These are some students on a ride. And this is a, sort of like a giant swing. And the students come down. Uh, we've got a high-speed camera, one of the inexpensive Casio high-speed cameras. And here come these two students scrolling down, or uh, uh, coming down past the low point of the of the ride. And Jake, the guy who's the the taller, the guy who's in the back of the ride there, we measured him. He's a meter and 85 uh, tall, and we can count the number of frames that it takes. So we start with him lined up on the right edge of that 
uh, vertical post in the background and then count the frame. So we go from frame 11 out to something like 25 or 26 frames that it took him. So if we have an uncertainty of one frame and a difference of 14, that's a, a lot of uncertainty. And the students, when they do their calculations, as they carry the uncertainty through, they see that they have a large amount of uncertainty in that measurement. So then we do really the same idea. We do this in the same assignment. Another video that's from Valley Fair. This one is using the same camera. Uh, so it's a, a roller coaster. And here we have the front of the roller coaster lined up with that post in the background. And by using the same method, the students can count frames. So we'll let this roller coaster roll past. I forgot to look at the number of frames where it first touches the roller coaster. But we have way more frames than we did in the previous one, something on the order of 100 frames. OK, so I do see that there's something here that says that you can't see the roller coaster video. It should be, can you see any of my screen? So Peter, I can definitely see it. Right. Um, so those of you who are having problems, um, there's a, a window at the top, or a window somewhere that says application sharing in the in the sort of menu bar of the window. Um, and so that's what we're looking at right. is something that's happening on his computer as opposed to opening the multimedia window. Um, if you still have tiles on your computer, ah, I see the issue. Peter, why don't you close the multimedia window? Because I think what, what you're trying to show them is actually behind that, and they're having a hard time moving it. So now that he has closed Great. the multimedia window, do you see the the roller coaster frame that says plus 187? Yeah, it looks like that worked. OK, so unfortunately, that means that those same people didn't see the previous one. Right, sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's OK. So at this point, I, don't, I think that, uh, that we, I'll show the idea of the roller coaster one. And it's, so, it's similar enough to the previous one that I, I bet people will get the idea. OK, so now we're looking at the roller coaster again. And we've got the, the front end of the roller coaster lined up with a post in the background. It's just lined up with the left edge of the post. And so now I can see that it's frame 45 where, where that occurs. So now we let the roller coaster roll past. I'm going to zip through. It's going to look weird on your screen while I zip through until the back of the roller coaster is lined up with roughly the same spot. So now we know it's taken some 140 frames for this roller coaster train to go 19 and a half meters. So the uncertainty of that measurement is way lower. And it's, it, it has been so far, in my experience, really easy for the students to see why that uncertainty is so much lower. So that's one of the ways that we use this video is that from time to time we'll say, OK, go through this calculation and, and quantify the uncertainty all the way through. And at the end, compare the uncertainty of two measurements and explain why the uncertainties are different. So it's one of the ways that, that I've been working on using these. All right, so here's another one. And this one I did upload into the multimedia library. So I'm going to reopen that. And so you should see a video now of Carl wearing his multicolored trunks, walking back and forth on his windsurfing. So since we are just reopening that, could I, I think I'd like to get green checks if people can see Carl. This is so cool. Great. OK, and the people who can't you can see the, a still shot of this video on my, uh, on my keynote. And the idea with this one is, uh, well, first of all, I have to point out how freezing cold my daughter is. She's been standing in the water there trying to get this shot. It took us about an hour, and it's September, and she's really not very happy right there. I notice that every time I turn this video on. Uh, but the, the idea is that with this, I asked them a really open-ended question. I said, what's the ratio of masses? What's the ratio of Carl's mass to the mass of the board? And why I kind of like that, and this is really an idea that I've noticed from people that use modeling a lot, these very open-ended questions where the students aren't given the quantities that they need. 
to answer the question. And so the first thing they have to think about is, well, what are the principles that, are, that I can use to figure this out? And what quantities will I need uh, to, to use those? And that is very much along the, the lines of, I think, what, uh, what Dan Meyer uh, does with his uh, videos, where you're not giving them that much information. You're really letting them figure out what information they need. And I guess one of, one of the advantages that Dan has talked about and that I really agree with is that that's more like the way problems are solved in, in the real world. Unlike the, the word problems that we use so much where, you know, they're given four numbers and they, they either need to use all four of them or, or three of them uh, if there's one tricky extra number thrown in. But here they're given no numbers. And so their first task is to figure out what are they, what are they even going to need to use to figure this out. So that open-ended, I have another example of an open-ended one. And this one is also not on the multimedia library. Uh, so I'm going to bring it up. <laughs> yeah, it was not as cold as she's making it look, but it was pretty cold. So let me bring up this uh, bounced tennis ball. This one is again going to show up uh, over my, that is not what I wanted to do. Over my keynote, you should see a black background with two vertical posts in it. It says frame zero across the bottom. So this video, a tennis ball comes bouncing across the stage. Goes past these two vertical posts. Bounces off the other side of the stage and out of the picture. And so the, the open-ended question that I asked them for this is, what was the velocity, including angle, uh, that the, of the ball when it bounced off the stage on the, on the left side? So when it first hit the stage and rebounded off the stage, how fast is it going and in what direction? And so I, I think I, I gave them this one for the first time last year. So I've been teaching this. Is the, that was the fifth year that I'd done AP. And it just completely stumped them. They, they just really didn't know where to begin because they weren't told any information. And so it was really interesting to see them go through this process of saying, well, what can we use to figure this out? How can, there must be some information that we can use here to, to figure it out. And that, again, that open-ended problem solving process was really re rewarding to see them travel through that. In my, uh, in, in a different class, I gave them some hints. So for example, I said, well, can you figure out how long it takes for the ball to travel between those horizontal posts? And, and how can that help you? And then I asked them, can you figure out how long the ball was in the air? And can you figure out how that can help you? So scaffolding them with some questions that would help them figure out what quantities they need. But taken as a completely open-ended question, I thought this was really quite interesting and quite challenging for them and very different from how the problems that are normally presented in a, uh, in a textbook. So that's the idea of using this, these as open-ended problems. Another thing that we've done is use them as supplements for, for labs. So this is a video that I have in the multimedia, a video of a blow dart hitting a cart. So I'm going to open it up in the multimedia window. I'll give that a second for that to load up for people. And this one, what I ended up doing was using two frame rates. So the goal with this one was to get them to try out the idea of conservation of momentum with a, a situation where they could figure out the momentum of the system at two different times. So we have the dart. And uh, if you can advance the, the video so that you can see when the dart has come out and is traveling across that grid, anywhere across that grid that says 0 to 30, uh, centimeters. And if you look at the frame counter during that portion of the video, it says that it's filmed at 240 frames per second. So this is again using one of these inexpensive Casio high-speed cameras. And for what it's worth, to get an image to look like that, you have to have a lot of light shining on the thing to get things to be, the shutter speed to be uh, fast enough that you get a sharp image. But at this point, they can count the frames, and they can see the distance, and they can figure out what the momentum of the cart, excuse me, of the dart is 
they're given the mass of the dart in the bottom of the video. But then if you advance a little bit farther until the dart hits the foam block, then you get a, a new timer that comes up. And now it's going at 60 frames per second. Uh, and the reason I did that is because otherwise the video takes a really long time for the cart to move uh, 10 centimeters because uh, it's, in, it's playing in much, much reduced motion. So those two frame rates let the students just see the video more quickly. And now they can calculate the velocity after the collision. They can figure out what the momentum is after the, the collision and compare those. Okay, so I see that there is. Yeah, a I was just saying that uh, there's a, the, la the last, yeah. second to last question on the chat board there for you. Which which level physics classes are you using these videos with? Which level physics classes are you using these videos? Um, so far, with both a college prep physics and algebra-based college prep physics, and with AP physics, I'd say I'm using using them equally with both. But I've done more of these open-ended style questions. That's gone more with with AP, and. Uh, more that use more scaffolding in the uh, in the college prep algebra based physics. But for example, the video that I'm just showing, the blow dart one, that was uh, in in both classes. Okay, so so that's the idea uh, of using it to verify the idea of conservation of angular momentum. And then the next video, so now we're back up on the keynote. And let's see, I don't have this one on the uh, multimedia viewer. So, but it's, it's not that different from the previous one in terms of how it looks. But here the idea is that I have a uh, pneumatic shooter made with PVC pipe and a PVC uh, larger diameter pipe used as a reservoir. And you pump it up with a bicycle tire pump and it shoots a peanut M&M. And the peanut M&M moves so fast that you can't see, you can just see a little blur of it going across the screen. And then it embeds into that foam block and it pushes the card across there. So this time we say, well, okay, now that we have verified the idea that conservation of momentum works during collisions, can you figure out what the velocity of that peanut M&M must have been in order to get the cart to go that fast? So that verify, or, uh, verify that this concept works and then use it to discover something new like the velocity of this, of this peanut. That's the idea with that, with that question. And I'll tell you, you read a million physics problems in textbooks about how something gets embedded in a block and then it slides across the table. And I will tell you that it was all very difficult to get that peanut M&M to stick into the block, not have little bits of peanut M&M come flying off, not blow the, flow, the foam block into pieces. That happened a bunch of times. So there's actually a, a cone-shaped hole in that, uh, in that foam block then a little blob of putty. So when the, when the M&M goes in there, it slowly goes into that cone-shaped hole and then sticks to the putty on the far end. So it, some of these videos look like, oh, sure, the peanut M&M just sticks into the block of foam, but that's uh, not really as simple as it was. Oh, so, so the air source was a, uh, uh, a, res a PVC pipe filled with compressed air. And then there's a quarter turn valve. So the, a large PVC reservoir, you pump that up, uh, with a bicycle pump and then open a quarter turn valve and it lets that air out into a smaller diameter pipe that's got the, the uh, peanut M&M in there. That was actually very easy to build and uh, it works really, really well. I'd say its main disadvantage is that the peanut M&M comes out extremely fast and so it's, it's quite a dangerous thing to have around. Okay, so another method that we've been using is to set something up in the, in the lab to show them how something works and then find a real world uh, example of that. So this one, once again, I'm going to bring up in the keynote. So this is gonna take me just a quick moment to find. Here we go. So this is just a brass cylinder, a brass lab weight that we slid across the tabletop here. and it slides along and comes to rest at some point along there. So this is another nice open-ended question. Uh, the question was, what's the increase of thermal energy of the, of, the, of the cylinder and the tabletop? And so again, they can go through and figure out, well, we need to find the 
change in kinetic energy, which means we need to know how fast it was going when it got to that zero centimeter mark. And they can figure that out because it comes to rest and they know how much time it took and they know the, they know the distance. So they're able to figure that one out. They could also figure out the coefficient of friction uh, if you ask them that just by looking at the rate of acceleration. So that's that, that set up in the lab. And then we replicated that one. So I'm going to close this window and bring up a similar one. So this one is a, an ice skating rink in town there, and the uh, person goes running along and slides across the ice. So really you have the same situation as what we just saw in the lab, and you can ask all of the same questions. What's the coefficient of friction between the ice and the person's sneakers, and uh, what's the change in thermal energy? Now, one reason I really wish you could see this video is that my son is in the background there. He's on the left side, and he's making this motion with his hands like he's putting his finger up to his head and swirling it in a circle to indicate that his dad, the person in the video, is crazy. So every time this video goes up, the students say, what is your son doing in the corner? Oh, he's pointing out that his dad is crazy. So I get a kick out of that every time I see this video. We then did the same thing. I think actually we did this before, and this might have something to do with why Carl is indicating that. So I'm going to bring up another very similar video. I'll wait for that to open up for everybody in the keynote window. And so now we just drove the car across the ice and put the brakes of the car on right at one at that same spot. Okay, I'm looking back at the uh, chat window, and it's a it's a it's an ice rink. It's a uh, a baseball diamond that just has got water poured over it, so there's no danger for their their car going across or going through the ice. So the brakes go on right there, and then exactly the same situation. You can see the car come to uh, uh, it slows and stops. It's got um, ABS brakes, and so the wheels go back and forth between rotating and not rotating as the car goes along there. And so you can make a comparison of the coefficient of friction or the effective coefficient of friction uh, on the car tires, which ought to be better, right, with that ABS braking compared to the sneakers just sliding along. But it turns out that actually the sneakers have a greater coefficient of friction than the car tires do, which I thought was really, that, that, that surprised me that it came out to be that way. So that's the idea then of, of going into the lab, trying something in the lab, sort of distilled down to it's really essential. It's just a weight going across a table and then and then going out in the field and finding examples that are that show that same idea. Okay, so the next idea that I, that I wanted to point out, and we actually I actually did this in class today and I was really pleased with with the results. Uh, the idea is that we can also incorporate data from a sensor into the video. So I'll show you two examples of that. So this one here is a cart with a magnetic bumper on the cart and then uh, also some magnets on a force sensor there. And so I will bring this one up over the keynote window. Uh, the collision itself isn't that interesting. Uh, the, the cart comes against, goes, rolls across and comes against that magnetic bumper and goes back out. You can use the, that little uh, distance measurement there, the 15 centimeters and the frames to figure out how fast it was going on the way in and how fast it's going on the way out. And so you can find the, the change in velocity and because you know the mass, you can find the change in momentum. But then what we did is while that collision occurred, we were recording that data and then just took the data and superimposed it, put it in the, in the video frame. So this is a video of the, uh, a, a screenshot of the force versus time for that collision that you just saw on the screen. And then I highlighted one of the rectangles there. And so when I, when I presented this, I said, well, you can use that rectangle, figure out what the area of that rectangle is, count the number of rectangles that you see, and compare that area with the uh, change in momentum that you got by watching the video. And, uh, 
and that worked. It actually came out with uh, the couple of times that we tried it. The, 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 if you include the uncertainty in the measurements, you got roughly the same amount of, uh, of area under that graph as you did change in momentum. So that's one example of the idea of putting uh, sensor data into the video. But the, the more successful one is the one that I tried today, which was uh, an example of simple harmonic motion. Oops, that is not what I wanted to do. Bear with me for a second here. Now, had I had a minute to put one more video up into the multimedia library, I would have put this one up. And maybe I still can uh, towards the end. But I'm sure everybody recognizes the situation. It's a, uh, a glider, an air glider with springs on either side. And off the screen on one side or the other is a, a vernier uh, motion sensor. And we're recording this as it slides back and forth. And then the graphs that we got uh, of that data are then superimposed over this so that as the glider goes across there, we can see synchronized with them the uh, position, velocity, and acceleration. So I'll just get it to go back, back to equilibrium here. Uh, actually, we'll get it to go to x max there. X max, all three of the graphs match. So the way I ended up teaching simple harmonic motion this year was to give them this video and a bunch of questions and say, okay, put the object at uh, put the object at X max and look at the acceleration and answer questions. So sort of the same questions that I've always asked, but rather than me explaining it to them, they were able to just use this video to develop the ideas of simple harmonic motion, kind of as as the as I asked them questions to develop the ideas of simple harmonic motion just by looking at this one single video. OK, I see uh, a question from Andy. So uh, it would be cool to measure x, v, and a, which I do have. Is that what you mean, Andy? It does have me separate no, measurements. What, what it looks like you have, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're using the vernier pasco distance measurement, and then vernier pasco is doing some derivatives for you. Is that right? Oh, you're exactly yeah, what right. I'm saying is, wouldn't it be cool if you use three different measurements, a position measurement, a separate measurement for speed, and a third measurement like an accelerometer for the acceleration? I see. Sure. You could, you could do that if you put a, a string on it and had the string run over right. a smart pulley and a very, very light mass on the smart pulley. And then you could, that, that would be cool because then it would, because here you're right. It's sort of, well, of course the velocity is going to look like that because it's the derivative of that position function. And it would be neater to have it if it really was a measurement of the velocity rather than a, a calculation from the velocity. Yeah, I agree. You should do that. You should set that video up. All right, up. I'm on it. All right, I'm on it. But so this idea, I really just kind of got, got these working just in the past couple of, uh, past month and a half or so, this idea of, of superimposing uh, data from a sensor in with the video and, and synchronizing it. So for example, you can see that on this video, I have it synchronized. But on the previous one, I just had a still shot uh, of it. And so at some point, I need to go back and do that magnetic collision and have the, the uh, force versus time graph synchronized just like this is so that you can see, for example, when the peak force occurs. All right. So let me show you one more. This one is, um, I wanted to show this idea of filming the same event with different cameras. So this one is in the multimedia library. So I'm going to click and open that up. And once again, I'll open it up because I know not everybody can see that. We'll open that one up. On here as well. It's going to take me a minute to resize this because this is a, an HD video. And so also, it's John a has a great question about three lines up in the chat board. Uh, OK, hold on a minute. Yeah, I will definitely talk about that a couple of slides down if we can, if we can wait. But I would very much like to share information about uh, uh, about how I made them. OK, so those of you who got the quick time in the multimedia window, you can look at it on your own. And, uh, but then I'll show in the, in the shared window that I have in the, in the keynote 
Um, that the, this is another one. So first of all, I'll show that how the two camera angles, as the as the uh, cart rolls down, the thing that you really want to be able to see when it gets to the bottom of the ramp there is what happens to that spring. And you just couldn't see the spring very clearly with a single camera. So a second camera filmed at the same time uh, shows a close up of the cart pushing against the spring and allows you to see how the spring and how far the spring is being compressed when the cart comes to rest. Now I'm going to stop it when it gets to its low position there. And so you're really able to see how much the spring has been compressed. And by looking at the, the dotted horizontal lines on the main video, you can see what vertical distance the cart has uh, rolled down uh, at that same time. So you can sort of see what its, its final vertical position is. And then it rolls back up, spring goes back to its unstretched position. And of course, the cart doesn't go as high as it started. So you can see that, that final position of the cart. And so unfortunately, I finished this video after we finished uh, this, this unit. But this is the way that I thought it would be really fun to teach with this, would be to say, here is a cart rolling down a ramp. And I have to say, this is an idea that I've also seen from people that do modeling. How many things can you calculate about this cart? How many quantities can you measure or calculate about the motion of this cart? And, and just let students figure out. I mean, I, I think there's an awful lot of things that you could figure out. Uh, you could figure out the rate at which energy is being dissipated by this thing. Uh, you see the change in energy as it, uh, when it goes from bottom to top, and you can figure out how long that took. Uh, so I thought that would be a really fun thing to give the students a very open-ended problem to say, what can you figure out with this? And again, somebody mentioned earlier, Dan Meyer, that that line of thinking is is uh, the same the same way that I think he presents things. I guess he calls it, what would you do with this? Or what can you do with this? So that's the idea of using two camera angles. Okay, so. One of the things, though, that I, I found is that if I give one video to all the students, uh, that very quickly they start to notice that the quantities are all the same. And it's just really tempting for them to, uh, to share information from one to the other. And so about halfway through this year, every time I'd set a video up, I would film multiple versions of it where things were just a little bit different. So I, I don't have to show this video. I think it's pretty self-explanatory what what's going on here. This cart has got a spring attached on the right end of the, uh, of the ramp there, and the cart gets pulled back, and you release the cart, and it accelerates across there. And when it gets to the zero mark, that's where the spring is complete, completely slack, and you can then measure the velocity. So you can do a conservation of energy or a work kinetic energy theorem uh, problem here and see uh, how fast it's going and, and therefore what the spring constant of the spring is, for example. And what I did was film a couple different versions so that each student can have a, or so that not all students end up with the same one. And I believe on this one, you cannot tell by looking at the video. There's no marking on the video that says which version that you have. So the students, as they're working, and of course I encourage them to work together, but not to work together and say, well, what's the answer? So as they're working on this, they would notice, hey, my spring didn't stretch the same distance that your spring did, or hey, my cart's not going the same speed as your cart. And so then they'd realize that they had different videos, and so they could share ideas, they could share the approach of how to work together, but not share the numerical answers. And as time has gone on, I've done more and more of those. So for example, a recent one that I did, I don't have the video uploaded, was we were doing um, simple harmonic motion, and we were measuring the rotational inertia of bike wheels by suspending the bike wheel from its rim and filming the pendulum motion of the wheel and figuring out what the rotational inertia was. So we filmed 12 bike wheels. So every student that went on, they, would, they had a pretty decent chance that they did not have the same bike wheel in their video that their, that their friend did. And so again, they could share the approach, share their method, but not share the numerical answers. And yes, that was a lot of work. However, it's done. I did it once. I've got 12 videos. I don't need to film those. 12 videos again, hopefully. Okay. 
Is this a good time to stop and look at a couple of questions? Yeah, Peter, you know, we have about we 10 minutes left. Andy. I think, you know, unless there's, I know that people definitely want to see your um, workflow. So if you had a slide that talked about the software that you use, maybe maybe to get, pull that up. But I think there, there are sure. very likely some questions. And so um, we can probably assume that Peter's willing to shift over and start paying more attention to the chat board now and, and maybe get some questions going. But Peter, maybe talk about your workflow really quick first. Yep, I would be happy to do that. Okay, so uh, let's see. I, I do want to point out one other thing, which is that I have a lot of these questions also embedded in WebAssign. And uh, I, I use WebAssign a lot, and I found that this really lends itself to it. So I'm just going to really quickly show an example. So this is a video that we already saw and talked about. This is the projectile motion one where it bounces across the screen. And I have two different versions in, in WebAssign where it's coded. So this is the version that is more scaffolded. So it says, uh, it asks the students how many frames they got. So for each one of these boxes, I, you can specify a range of acceptable values for which it will give the student the right answer because they're not all going to count the same number of frames. This particular one doesn't have a second little answer box to have the students put in their plus minus, their uncertainty. So this particular problem, I wasn't wor working on that, but often it does have that. And then what it does is that all of the subsequent answers are calculated based on that student's estimate. As long as their estimate was within an acceptable range, then it predicts what their answer ought to be for the next part and uh, gives them a, a green check only if their answer is correctly calculated based on their previous work. And what's nice about that is that if you have a multi-step problem, it tells students as they're working their way through uh, if they're doing it correctly. And what I like to do is give them one like this where it's all scaffolded out and ask them in multiple steps and then I'll just scroll down. This is the, so I wouldn't give them this same problem, but this just shows the, the idea. Here it's pared down. It just asks them the frames and the amount of time, and then makes a big jump from there to say, what was the, what was the velocity when the ball left the ground on the left side of the stage? So I just wanted to point out that putting these into web assignment is another thing that I've done that I think has been very, uh, very effective. Okay, so. Uh, let's see. Let me talk about the cameras first. Uh, I, I would say that I've updated since I did this. I use the, the Casio high-speed uh, camera, and I have a Canon DSLR, uh, and I use the 60 frame per second. Probably 80% of the videos are done with that 60 frame per second camera. It takes so much clearer images that it's really much easier to see all these measured quantities using that. Uh, than it is with the, with the Casio camera. The resolution of the Casio camera, particularly in high speed, uh, makes it really hard to get very good videos. So that's the cameras. And then for the video editing, I started using uh, iMovie, which worked reasonably well. You can trim them down. You can put text on top of them. But that superimposing those grids is really hard in iMovie, and it's really easy in Final Cut. So anybody who's going to be serious about doing this, I would encourage you to get Final Cut. There probably are other programs out there that work well too, but those are the two that I've used. And for, for anything serious, the amount of time that you'll spend trying to figure out how to get iMovie to do stuff, it, it takes a long time and it just doesn't do it as well. Final Cut, it's very, very easy to, uh, to do it. I use QuickTime for playing them back. Most of the students at my school have QuickTime on their computers or can download it since it's free. And it lets them do that, that key frame by frame playback. And I don't know of other video players that, that do that as well. Uh, I am, I'm not looking at all of them, but QuickTime is, does work for Windows. So we, the Windows computers that are at our uh, school all have QuickTime on there as well. Uh, and so the, a lot of questions about how, what's going to happen to these next, to be honest, teaching 140 students and making these videos is at the same time as tapped me out. I haven't had time to do any, any real public, publication of these, but I definitely plan to. Uh, I'm working with a couple of different groups to, uh, to have a way to publish these so, students, so teachers can use them and hopefully contribute to the ideas and even contribute videos. I'd love to have help other people having either ideas for videos that I should shoot or people who are interested in shooting their own videos. I'm teaching a uh, class at the UW University of Wisconsin River Falls summer uh, program for physics teachers about making and using these uh, these videos. But honestly, what happens is that people send me an idea, or I have an idea, and I think that that is what ends up taking my time 
not publishing the work, which is what I really should do. So that is the information that I've got, and uh, I, I, can, I see that these questions are flying past, and I would really like to get a chance to answer some of them, even though we only have so a few So Peter, I've been left. keeping pretty close track of the chat board. I think that I can distill some of it. Um, one of the things that came up was this notion Great. of um, overlays, right? The, the scales that you've been adding to your videos, and the yes. notion, you and I talked about this up in Duluth, um, you know, this notion of maybe there's yep. some overlays people could add to just existing videos, even if they might not be able to go frame by frame. Um, do you or does anyone else know about ways to add those overlays, because what you do is, is pretty time intensive, right, is with the Final Cut Pro. At first, yeah. So John, you say Keynote, what do you mean by that? Oh, okay. Oh, great, John's going to tell us about it, wonderful. Um, and then, uh, let's see, so um, you talked about your students having the, the quick time on their machines, but I see that some people are recommending VLC, have you had played with that? Um, yeah, only only to the degree that I know that I have VLC on my on my Mac and it works, but I haven't noticed any advantage o with that over it. Now it might just be because I haven't looked. QuickTime has worked pretty well, so I haven't put a lot of effort in trying to find an alternative because because it's free, because it runs on Windows and Mac. Uh, I didn't go any farther than that. If a student doesn't have it, I just say, hey, go download QuickTime. It's not a bad thing to have on your machine. So, so from what I've seen, VLC ought to work. So what Rhett I'm is saying, sure what um, and I'm wondering about your experience, is that QuickTime rounds the frames to the nearest second, and then Joss is saying that VLC gives you um, the exact time of the frame. Is that is that what your experience as well? Huh. QuickTime doesn't round to the nearest second. It rounds to the nearest frame, but I have all these videos that are you know 240 frames per second, and it definitely stops them at individual frames. QuickTime on iPad doesn't do that. QuickTime on iPad does only allow you to do larger steps, but on the on the computer, I've never noticed so a, it rounding. A couple things. Um, I think what Peter is doing that gets around the problem Rhett mentions is, Peter is Peter's actually putting in the frames as a separate counter on the video. So you're not needing to use Correct. QuickTime's ability Correct. to time it because it, it does only kind of time to the, it doesn't time perfectly when you're scrolling through the time bar. But uh, you mean the time little, the time yeah, reading on the bottom the of the QuickTime window? Yeah. Yep, you're exactly right. And that is how I get around it, is that I put that frame counter, I can do that in Final Cut. And so we don't have to worry about what the QuickTime So what I was says. thinking about, though, for actually overlaying this, like, and one of the questions I have for you, Peter, is Dan Meyer is very much about giving kids something raw, like a raw piece of video, and not having the axioms right. overlaid and all that stuff, and only putting that stuff in when kids are like, well, we need to measure this. And a thought for how to do that without having kids become proficient in Final Cut Pro is to use a piece of software like Keynote, or PowerPoint could maybe do this, but I think Keynote could do this better, where you import the movie into Keynote, and then you can put anything you want next to it, or over it even. And so Dan Meyer created a little counter animation that is a timer so that people could time these videos, but you could just as easily create a grid and put that over there as well. Put that over there as well. So, so what I'm, I'm, I, I'm kind of envisioning um, if kids yeah, wanted to have this kind of ability to kind of analyze their own videos and didn't want to go to Tracker and didn't want to go to, um, you know, Logger Pro, they would get a video, they would throw it into Keynote, and then they would essentially make their own grid on top of the video the same as you would draw a grid in Keynote and overlay that on top of the program. And they could just as easily also overlay I angles see. and yep. stuff like that because it can do measurements like that. And if you pre-created a timer for them that just kind of ran on seconds or something like that, you could also throw that in and set that timer so that it starts at exactly the same time the video starts so that clicking the you know, clicking essentially the next slide starts the video and the timer, and they kind of run together, and you've got a running timer track. Right. So, uh, I think what you're suggesting is exactly the right the right next step. Is that is that it would be really good to give them this video with nothing on it at all, because you're right. It really gives them a big clue when there's a meter stick across the middle of the wheel. You know that you need to measure the the diameter radius of the wheel. It would be really neat to just say, you know, you have to figure out whether you have to measure that. 
But what the best software tools are to do that is a question, and maybe something like, you know, I've been envisioning that if I could, and I have no idea technology-wise how to do this, but if there was a toolbar and you could drag statistics yeah. out, drag protractors out, drag stop watches out, and make your measurements. Ultimately, yeah, I, I guess there are really things cool out there that let you measure things in pixels for, like, website software. Like, there are rulers that you can drag out. Mm -hmm. I don't know that there's anything that does timing that way. But I, that that does seem like a really cool thing, that it would be very easy and kids wouldn't have to master a complex piece of software to do that. Right. So, this is awesome, anyways. Thanks so much for showing it. Oh, you're welcome. Well, Peter, I hate to interrupt here, but it is uh, 9.30 in the awesome time zone, and I know that a lot of people count on us on ending on time. So before we go on to any further questions, if we could please just do our, our traditional round of applause for Peter. This has been really fantastic. Um, and so don't let the deafening applause knock you over, Peter. Um, but you know, one of the things I was thinking about as well is that we are really trying to kick around exactly what to do with our new website that um, we've recently registered, uh, Global Physics department, or maybe it's globalphysicsdept.org. Um, we haven't done anything with it yet, but we've, we've sort of made sure that we, ha we have the rights to it. And you know, uh, yet another place where you might be able to share some stuff, too, so we can definitely keep in contact about that. Yeah, well, that, that, I, I think that's sort of the next thing. As I, I, one of the ways that I've justified doing this work is that it's hopefully not only useful to me and to my students. I would love to share this, both the work and have collaboration with other people who are interested in contributing. So I, I think that the Global Physics Workshop, uh, Global Physics Department website would be a great way to do that. And I see someone asked whether it's up. Well, we just own the, the rights. We haven't put anything up there yet. Uh, I don't. Is Heather here tonight? I don't see her. Um, Heather has done a lot of legwork for us there, and we just haven't done uh, much with it yet. But we certainly are doing some planning. Um, let me make a quick announcement about next week before people start uh, going out. Although um, Peter, Peter, can you hang around for just a little bit longer? Or okay. So the announcement about yes, next sure. week, you guys. Yeah. Um, I went back to check through my emails, and we do have someone scheduled to to um, speak next week. It's uh, Brendan Noon, who actually gave his video for us to watch. Um, whenever that was last week. Um, and Brendan does a lot of flipped classroom stuff and wanted to come and talk to us about that. I went back to check my email trail and realized that he said he could do it, but then I didn't say he for sure could, that we, we locked him in on that date. So he's not here tonight, but I'm going to count on him coming. And I think that if he doesn't, um, I can certainly talk about what I do, although what I do is a little bit different than the flipped classroom. And is Paul Anderson still here? Paul, would you be willing to chime in a little bit next week as well? Um, about the flipped class stuff, great. And so I think that we'll just go ahead and do um, um, flipped class um, information uh, for next week in, in a physics classroom. And then the week after that, coming up fast, if I have my calendar correct in my mind, would be the last Wednesday of April. Um, can someone double check me on that? I think that's right. So we actually need some volunteers for some people to be coached. Um, and so for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, we do coaching of a high school teacher and a college instructor, at least we try to, at the end of uh, the last Wednesday of every month. And I don't have any volunteers that I know of for this month. Um, and so please, if you're interested in videotaping a, sh a short portion of your own teaching and getting it up um, by, let's see, if you could have it up by next would it be next week, I guess? Yeah, by next week would be awesome. Um, if, and if, so if you're willing to do that, please let me know um, and so that we can get that going. Um, so anyways, ba back to Peter if people have more questions. Um, so Peter, a little, one other thing that happened in the chat board while you were, while you were talking earlier is the notion of um, using Tracker or the Auto Tracker feature in Tracker for students to do this. And it seemed like in the chat board people were going back and forth about the notion of yet another piece of software to get the students to do stuff, um, whereas you're doing a lot of software on the front end to give them something that's probably just going to work and all they need is quick time. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I've not, I haven't used Tracker, and the idea of something that does auto tracking seems that's really interesting because the the main objection that people have uh, have had with students have had, and really that I've had with using Logger Pro is that is the you know you, you're doing 10 or 15 or 20 minutes of graphing before you can even start saying, okay, I really want to analyze whether this thing whether this is a good example of conservation of momentum. Uh, so now whether Tracker can be used. If there's a feature on there that allows that process to happen more quickly, that would be really neat. Uh, and it's, it's definitely something that I, should, that I should look into or someone else should look into with, by using these videos.
And then Peter, maybe as we wrap up here, um, when you reflect on, on the work that you have done, um, the bang for your buck, right? So you, you've talked about wanting to benefit the, the community, but you've also talked about how, hey, I have 12 videos now. I can envision things moving forward in the future. Um, it, has your motivation been, boy, I can see how this is going to help me in the future, or is often your motivation, man, this is going to help me tomorrow? <laughs> uh, that's a very good question. I'm frankly motivated by the fact that I think it's that it works well, and I, I I love making these videos, and I find like when I get a video that really captures some quantity or some concept that I'm trying to get across to my students, I really just end up doing it not for either of those reasons, but really just because I can do it, and it turns out I, I get motivated by the process, and uh, the amount of time that goes into making a video is definitely not the pay the payback doesn't come uh, right away from that. It takes too much time. But the payback has been that some of these videos, uh, you know, the one of the cart going down in the, in the spring, the two viewpoints, I just enjoy doing that. And so that's really been the main motivation. Now that they're done, uh, I do hope to be able to use them with my students, but even that won't really be worth the amount of effort to do it. I think that sharing them and hopefully letting other teachers and students use them would, would help that, would make that payoff uh, closer to even. Well, once again, Peter, I want to say thank you. And, and, and once again, of course, I'm excited that my own kids are, are in this school district that you teach in. So I'm really excited about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so am I. Um, and great. I know I do like to honor everyone's time. So thanks, thanks everyone. And thanks, Peter, for coming again for tonight for the Global Physics Department. We'll, and, and we'll see you next week. Um, I will post the recording of tonight, um, either later tonight or early tomorrow morning. So I hope everyone has a great week. And, and Peter, once again, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome, and thank you very much, Annie, and thanks for everybody else. Great comments and questions. I appreciate your feedback.